Hi, I'm Agent Ford. Do you think you can help me solve another true crime mystery? J.C. Dugard was born on May 3, 1980, to Terry Probin and Ken Slayton, though the latter was unaware he was a father. Shortly into her childhood, her mother remarried to Carl Probin. However, J.C. was never close to him. She had an infant baby sister named Shana, born in 1990. Later that year, in September, the family moved from Arcadia in Louisiana to Myers in California. Here in the Gold Coast, Dugard's shy and timid disposition kept her tumultuously worried about her school life, especially during her fifth grade. On June 10, 1991, the 11-year-old J.C. was abducted while on her way to the bus stop en route for school. She had been walking in pink clothes when a gray car pulled over. J.C. assumed he needed help or directions and approached, at which point the driver, Philip Gerito, pacified her with a stun gun and dragged her into the car. His assistant and wife, Nancy, held J.C. down as she struggled between states of consciousness for the three-hour, 120-mile trip to her kidnapper's home, occasionally begging to be let go on account of her family being unable to pay a ransom. Her stepfather, Carl, saw this happen and pursued on his mountain bike to no avail, turning back soon after to call the police. Immediately after the kidnapping was reported, searches began. However, no leads were discovered. Initial speculation was cast on both the stepfather, Carl Probin, and the father, Ken Slayton. Yet Ken didn't know J.C. existed, and Carl passed multiple polygraph tests alongside no apparent motive. It didn't take long for local and national media to pick up and run the story. Local volunteers and professionals began a searching effort Thousands of flyers and posters were distributed. The town of Myers was covered in pink ribbons, serving as a constant reminder. Months and then years of candlelit vigils, fundraising activities, and continued searching followed. J.C.'s mother, Terry, established J.C.'s hope to direct the efforts, and a substantial reward was offered for information leading to her daughter's location. Upon arriving at the Gerardo's house in Contra Costa County, the now naked J.C. had a blanket wrapped around her head and was escorted, handcuffed, into a soundproofed shed in the couple's back garden. The only thing left in her possession, unknown to her captives, was a small butterfly ring she managed to hide from them until the very end of her ordeal. She was forced to shower with Philip, then raped for the first time and told that she would be attacked if she attempted to escape the trained Dobermans. For a period, Dugard was only allowed to see Gerardo when she was given food and makeshift toilet facilities. She was allowed a television eventually, but it was limited to a number of channels that wouldn't show her face. After a month and a half, she was relocated to a larger room and cuffed to a bed. She would sit and watch as Gerardo went on methamphetamine binges, at which point he would insist the demon angels permitted her to help him with his sexual impulses. Sometimes. He'd fall into a lapse of begging, sobbing, and apologizing to Dugard in between bouts of listening out for voices and declaring he was chosen by God. Gerardo would sexually abuse her daily, beginning June 17, 1991, with select incidents being filmed starting a month after that. Seven months after her abduction, Nancy was introduced to Dugard with a stuffed cuddly toy and chocolate milk. She would apologize to Dugard too, but manipulated the young girl into depending on her through positive and negative reinforcement that would condition Dugard into wanting the woman's approval. When Gerito failed a drug test and briefly returned to prison, Nancy continued the captivity. Dugard claimed she was just as twisted and evil as Gerito. At one point, they discovered she'd been signing her journal entries with her real name. Infuriated and worried, her jailers made her tear it out and forbade her from writing, saying, or using the word J.C. Dugard again. Doctor and dentist access was, naturally, unavailable, and it took three years until Dugard was allowed time without the handcuffs. She was given cooked food for the first time on April 3, 1994. Soon afterward, 
she discovered she was pregnant. After months of childbirth video watches and amateur research, Dugard successfully delivered her first daughter on April 18, 1994, at 14 years old. She gave birth to her second on November 13, 1997, when she was 17. Shortly after the second child was born, Gerardo constructed an eight-foot-tall fence circumventing the garden and set up a tent. Dugard and her daughters were given freedom in the form of that yard where Dugard would plant flowers and homeschool her children. She later claimed these were some of her only solaces in her situation's bleakness, alongside a secret journal she'd begun keeping. However, when Nancy became increasingly jealous, Dugard was informed her daughters would refer to Nancy as their mother and Dugard as their sister. This continued throughout their captivity, including on the irregular times Nancy would take them to Walmart, nail salon, and other shops and establishments. By 2009, J.C. was 29 years old and had been held hostage for 18 years. Gerido's mother was now living in his house and being cared for by Nancy and Dugard. Gerido created a print shop to make money wherein Dugard would design all of the graphic work involved. Customers who spoke to Dugard via the business phone report that she did an excellent job, was cheerful, and made no mention of her abduction. She continued to associate with her false name and had not used her original since she was forced to stop. In that same year of 2009, on August 24th, Gerido visited the University of California, Berkeley, with the two young girls, requesting permission to hold a God's Desire special event at their campus was reported for unusual behavior. The manager he spoke to, Lisa Campbell, was concerned by his erratic mannerisms and the two girls' sullen and submissive demeanors. She requested him to leave his name and visit the following day. However, that same day he paid a visit to the FBI's office in San Francisco and left a four-page manifesto concerning religion, sexuality, and solutions to deviancy. He returned to the campus of Berkeley on August 25th. Their meeting was accompanied by Officer Ali Jacobs, who had run a sufficient background check. After noticing the pale complexion of the girls, she called the parole office. Two agents were dispatched to his house, but after putting him under arrest, they found only his mother and Nancy. On the way to the station, Gerido claimed the girls were daughters of a relative. After a brief review, he was allowed to return home under the condition he would return the following day. Even though Gerido had a month prior been forbidden from association with minors, and he had violated his parole by visiting the University of California. On August 26, 2009, Gerido visited the parole office in Concord, California with Nancy, the two girls, and Dugard. They were all separated and investigated. Dugard reported that knowing Gerido's sex offending past, he was a changed man and a great person before increasingly getting more agitated and hostile. Eventually, Gerido admitted to raping and kidnapping Dugard. For the first time in 18 years, J.C. Dugard identified herself by name and was quickly reunited with her mother. Unsurprisingly, Dugard found remembering her name difficult. So, what of the perpetrators? Philip Greg Gerido was born on April 5, 1951, in Pittsburgh, California. He had been arrested in 1972 for sexually assaulting a 14-year-old girl. However, she declined to testify and so the case didn't go to trial. He married Christine Murphy in 1973, who later claimed he was abusive and even kidnapped her at one point. In 1976, he kidnapped the 25-year-old Catherine Calloway took her to a Reno, Nevada warehouse and sexually assaulted her for more than five hours. He was apprehended when a police officer noticed the abandoned car and investigated. He was charged, convicted, declared a sexual deviant and chronic drug abuser, and evaluated by a neurologist who deemed him normal. He began serving a 50-year sentence on June 30, 1977, and met Nancy Bosanegra while she was visiting her uncle. He was released on parole on August 26, 1988 with an ankle bracelet monitor and was frequently visited. 
Gerito kept an irregularly updated blog titled God's Desired Church, in which he bragged about his ability to control sound using his mind. He'd asked numerous people to sign testimonials confirming that he could do this and claimed he was in the process of developing a device that would enhance the effect. I don't know who this neurologist was who deemed him normal, but I certainly hope they aren't practicing anymore. The day after Dugard was reunited with her family, KCRA-TV conducted an interview with Gerido. He claimed the events to be a heartwarming story of him managing to turn his life completely around and that the manifesto he submitted to the FBI would make people fall over backward. He denies ever touching the two girls. This document was eventually released by the FBI and is titled, Origin of Schizophrenia Revealed. Two days after J.C. was recovered on August 28, 2009, Gerito and Nancy pleaded not guilty to kidnapping, rape, and false imprisonment. Nancy's bail was established at $30 million and none was set for Gerito. Nancy's sentence was negotiated down thanks to her attorney's suggestion that she was also under the manipulative and substance-centered influence of Gerito and had established Stockholm Syndrome. On April 28, 2011, they pleaded guilty to kidnapping and assault, and on June 2, 2011, Gerito was sentenced to 431 years to life imprisonment, while Nancy was given 36 years. Dugard did not attend the sentencing, but permitted a written message she authored to be read aloud by her mother. Gerito is also a person of interest in at least one other missing persons case. On two separate occasions, law enforcement officers visited Gerito's house and failed to search the back garden. The police also failed to connect the kidnapping and rape of Catherine Calloway Hall in 1976 with J.C. Dugard's abduction, despite the location being the same. A report was filed on April 22, 1992, with the caller saying that they saw her in a large yellow van less than a year after Dugard's disappearance. A large yellow van was found on Gerito's property after the arrest. In June 2002, the fire department responded to a juvenile shoulder injury at the Gerito's residence's pool. This information wasn't relayed despite Gerito's past crimes and the fact no pool nor child should have been there. In 2006, one of his neighbors called the police complaining about Gerito's psychotic sexual addictions and the unusual teens in his backyard. An officer was sent to speak with Gerito on his doorstep for less than half an hour. Witnesses frequently saw her in the house, sometimes answering the door even, but she reportedly never expressed an issue. Nonetheless, several leads were dropped on officials' laps that were never followed up. Shortly after Gerito's arrest, Sheriff Warren E. Roop of Contra Coast County apologized to the victims for their repeated failures. Dugard sued California State on the claims these lapses and failures contributed to her continued captivity and in 2010 was awarded $20 million. Dugard adapted to her family once more, with her stepfather Carl Probin, reporting she and her daughters were in good health. Many consider J.C. Dugard's return to stand as an important reminder to any who are suffering like those involved. Despite the harrowing, horrible incidents that Dugard experienced, she made it home in the end. I doubt I'll ever experience the amount of pain and turmoil both her, Carl, and her mother Terry went through. Three weeks after release, Dugard began animal therapy with the assistance of her mother and sisters, and in 2011, she published her first autobiography, A Stolen Life. In 2016, J.C. Dugard released her follow-up book, Freedom, My Book of Firsts, detailing the adaptation and reintegration she underwent following her recovery. The two girls are prospering in education happy with their mother but dealing with their father's manipulative effects on their formative years. J.C. and Terry live together, and when asked how they feel about the girls meeting their father in prison, they both express not being okay with the idea but accepting if it happened. They have continued to work with the J.C. Foundation and other organizations throughout the years, and J.C. has frequently discussed Stockholm Syndrome to spread awareness of its debilitative and self-perpetuating effects. 
Her eyes are still sensitive to the sunlight, and she's expressed feeling like a person who has lived many lifetimes. When I see JC's story, I'm infuriated. I'm infuriated by all the people that failed her. The police officers, the parole board, the neurologists. And maybe I'm a little infuriated at us for not having stricter punishments for monsters like these, for not looking out for each other a little bit better. But JC has one very important lesson she wants to teach us. Despite all the things she's gone through, she smiles on camera and she tells us, life doesn't have to end if you don't want it to. It's all in how you look at it. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button and share it with your fellow investigators. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Hit that notification bell so you never miss a case. With that being said, stay safe, and I'll see you guys at the next crime scene.